The world is becoming increasingly unstable. Thanks to record inflation and growing food shortages, numerous countries are witnessing civil unrest, protests and clashes that could topple governments and even lead to war. Now, you may have heard of some of these already. However, given general Western media bias, the true extent of the crisis is going unreported. So, in the video today, I'm going to tell you about some of the most volatile regions of the world, why the global situation could get worse, and what it all means for you. Let's start off our global tour in South America, a continent that has seen its fair share of political and economic instability. While the struggles of those in Venezuela are well documented, people in other countries there are also feeling the pain. One of the most notable of these is Peru, where protests against sky-high inflation have been going on for months. Fuel and fertilizer prices, both impacted by the sanctions on Russia, have been rising alarmingly. Now, the high fertilizer prices are of most concern given that fertilizer is a key ingredient in food production. Moreover, given that this food needs to be transported to the cities from the farms, fuel is also required, another rising input cost. Naturally, these economic conditions are not going to be good for the people in power in Peru. Pedro Castillo, the socialist leader of Peru, has seen his approval ratings plummet. At least 63% of Peruvians favor his resignation. And this comes after him being in power for less than a year. When disapproval of the status quo gets this bad, people naturally take to the streets. The protests in the capital, Lima, got so severe that the president had to declare a state of emergency and implement a curfew. They eventually turned deadly, and at least six people were killed in the unrest. But it wasn't only the cities that saw protests. In rural areas, farmers and farm workers blocked highways and access to major cities. The military was eventually called in to clear them away and open the roads. Then, in an attempt to quell the protests, the president presented a constitutional amendment that would ban, quote, monopolies, oligopolies, hoarding, speculation, or price agreements, as well as the abuse of dominant positions in the market. However, the protests continued and even stranded tourists in some of the country's most visited regions. Tourism was a popular form of income in Peru, and the protests further damaged a sector that was already reeling from pandemic restrictions. OK, so that's Peru. The next country on our list is Argentina. Now, Argentina is certainly no stranger to inflation and economic instability, but things have gotten considerably worse there over the past few months. The annual inflation rate in the country is racing past 70%. Yes, 70%. This comes as the value of the Argentinian peso has completely collapsed. These combined effects have hit ordinary Argentinians hard, and the country has seen the ranks of the poor swell to over 40% of the population. Food price inflation is once again the biggest driver, with a month-on-month -month increase of almost 10%. Thankfully for Argentina, however, the country had a saviour in the form of the IMF earlier this year. Now, for those of you who are not fully clued up on this Global Loan Sharks MO, I have a video on it which will be in the description. Now, the IMF is looking to hatch a deal with Argentina for a $45 billion loan, one the government says is needed in order to avoid a default. However, it will come with some pretty arduous conditions. For example, it will require Argentina to cut fiscal spending and eliminate energy subsidies at a time when we are facing a global energy crisis. This spurred anti-IMF protests across Argentina as people took to the streets and burned IMF flags. No doubt the memories of previous IMF policies left a bitter taste in their mouths. The protests in the country have since only intensified and show no signs of slowing down. Let's continue our world tour, though, as we travel from South to Central America, more specifically, Panama. By Central American standards, Panama is seen as quite economically and politically stable. However, in July of this year, the largest anti-government protests in decades erupted across the country, 
as people took to the streets to air their grievances. Some of these grievances related to corruption, but the predominant theme was high inflation and general cost of living. Initially, it was teachers who led the protests, but they were eventually joined by construction workers, students and members of indigenous groups. The protesters not only set up burning tyre blockades leading into Panama City, but they also did the same on the Pan-American Highway. Ironically, this led to further shortages of food and fuel in some areas and also impacted the flow of goods through the Panama Canal. The government subsequently implemented a number of measures aimed at reining in the cost of living. This included a reduction in the price of fuel and at least 10 other staples. The petrol price cap was dropped even further from $3.95 to $3.25 per gallon, a stark contrast to June's $5.20 per gallon. But even then, the measures were not enough to quell the protests. OK, so that's Panama. Let's leave America behind now and head on over to the other side of the world. Our next stop is Bangladesh, a country that until recently had one of the fastest growing economies in the world. It was even one that the World Economic Forum held up as a model for how countries could escape poverty. Talk about the kiss of death. However, no amount of economic development can be sustained in an environment with soaring energy costs. Due to the high price of fuel, the country had to limit its imports lest it be hit with a balance of payments crisis similar to that seen in Sri Lanka. The Bangladeshi government took the dramatic step of increasing the price of fuel by almost 50% in less than a week. This unprecedented hike in fuel prices had knock-on effects for the cost of food as well. Protests broke out as people hit the streets to voice their grievances. According to Mohammed, a resident of the northern city of Dinajpur, quote, When I go to the market, I can't buy enough food for my family. If the price of fuel keeps increasing like this, I can't look after my parents or send my children to school. If I lose my job, I might have to start begging in the street. His dire situation is not unique. Bangladesh's energy minister points to external factors that have forced his country to resort to these measures. It's also the reason why they've decided to go cap in hand to the IMF. Bangladesh is now working with the fund to secure a loan program from the quote, IMF Resilience and Sustainability Trust. In total, they're seeking about $4.5 billion, a punchy number, especially for a country like Bangladesh. While it is yet to be confirmed by the IMF, I'm sure that this loan will come with strings attached. How else would the puppet master control the world's leaders? Of course, Bangladesh is not the only developing country holding out the begging bowl to the IMF. Not far west, Pakistan is also having a pretty torrid time this year as food and fuel inflation ravage its economy. The inflation rate there just hit a 47-year high, coming in at almost 30%. Food price inflation has climbed 30% while the cost of transport is up nearly 63%. Now this can be partly attributed to global trends and partly to local economic mismanagement. Pakistan's foreign reserves have been depleting rapidly and are threatening to push it into a balance of payments crisis. This has forced the government to hike taxes on fuel and increase power tariffs. Now the hope is that the $1.1 billion loan from the IMF will help stave off this crisis. But as is the case with all the other borrowers, these loans come with a lot of pain. Some Pakistanis protested against the IMF loan, but were overshadowed by much larger protests over the loss of the mandate of the Prime Minister Imran Khan. And while these protests are not directly related to the increasing cost of living, they could devolve into that. A hungry populace is more likely to lash out at those in power, even more so if they view that power as questionable. Moreover, Pakistan is also enduring devastating floods as I record this. Over 1,000 people have been killed and the floods have completely destroyed much arable farmland. This will further exacerbate the food crisis and leave people starving. In short, Pakistan is a tinderbox 
that's only short of a match. Let's continue our trip of the Asian subcontinent and stop off in Sri Lanka, a country that has been through some of the harshest economic conditions of all. I won't go over it all here as I have a complete video about that which I'll leave linked to in the description for you folks. But the TLDR is that misguided environmental policies combined with a balance of payments crisis led to a shortage of food and fuel. This spurred intense anti-government protests which eventually led to the country's president fleeing on an army plane. Now things haven't really improved in Sri Lanka since then. Millions more have been pushed into poverty and the government is turning to a familiar face for a bailout. Damn, they really do have their fingers in every pie, don't they? The Sri Lankan government's negotiations with the IMF have been going on for months and just last week a preliminary agreement for a $2.9 billion bailout was reached. Whether Sri Lanka can even implement the policies that the fund will require is anyone's guess as the country is already so close to the edge. Leaving Sri Lanka's troubled shores, our journey takes us next to Indonesia, Southeast Asia's largest economy. Earlier this year, a number of student-led protests took aim not only at the increasing costs of cooking oil, but also, surprise, surprise, the government. The protesters were concerned that President Joko Widodo could try and extend his stay in power. Now, these protests took place not only in the capital, Jakarta, but also in a number of the country's provinces. While they have recently calmed down, I have a feeling that things are likely to get more volatile over the coming months. That's because on Saturday, fuel prices in Indonesia increased by 30%. This was the first price hike that the country had seen in eight years. Now, fuel prices are a politically sensitive issue in Indonesia. In fact, in 1998, similar fuel price hikes led to mass protests that eventually led to the toppling of longtime dictator Suharto, the power of a pissed-off populace, eh? OK, so that's Asia. But let's get back on our travels and head to the old continent, where, as the Rolling Stones song goes, troubles are coming in more ways than one. Yes, Europe is facing some strong economic headwinds. Sky-high energy bills, food inflation and the real prospect of shortages this winter. Now, I've talked about this a number of times on the channel and I'll leave some videos in the description for you. While many of these problems are related to factors like the pandemic shutdowns and the war in Ukraine, government policies have also been a big contributing factor. These policies have led to increasing frustration and anger among people across Europe. According to a recent report that tracks global civil unrest, the potential for wide-scale unrest in Europe is rising. We've already seen this playing out in some countries. For example, about two months ago, there were large farmer protests in the Netherlands. These were driven by the Dutch government's proposed policies aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. More specifically, livestock farming was singled out as one of the key drivers of emissions and policies to limit livestock numbers have been explored. Needless to say, Dutch farmers weren't too happy about this. Protests began in early June and initially there wasn't much coverage of it in the mainstream media. That was until the numbers swelled in July. We all saw those images of thousands of farmers descending on Dutch cities with their tractors and other equipment. This drew widespread global attention to their movement, much the same way that the truckers' protests in Canada did earlier in the year. It also called into question the rationale for trying to limit the production of food at a time when food price inflation is at unsustainable levels. Now, angry farmers protesting is one thing, but an entire country protesting over food shortages is something else entirely. So, for the final stop on our trip, let's head to Eastern Europe and visit the Czech Republic. Over the weekend, more than 70,000 people descended on central Prague to protest at sky-high energy bills and inflation. Inflation which the Czech Central Bank predicts could hit 20% in the coming months, the highest level since 1993. Now, some members of Team Coin Bureau actually live in Prague and they told me that these were some of the largest protests the country has seen in years. 
This turnout is also pretty surprising when you consider that Prague is a city of only 1.3 million people. And it reminds me of a study conducted a few years ago which found that non-violent protests involving at least 3.5% of the population have almost always brought about change. You can think of it as the critical mass required for mass mobilization. If so many people are already protesting in Prague, one can only imagine many more will come out when the winter energy bills really start to bite. And could these protests spread to other countries in Eastern Europe? They all have similarly high levels of inflation and are facing the prospect of gas shortages this winter. There's also nothing stopping these protests from spreading north and west. German citizens aren't too happy about the prospect of gas rationing this winter, and in the UK people are already starting to push back against the unprecedented energy price hikes. It seems as if Europe really could be in for a quote, winter of discontent. Any Brits in the audience will get the reference. OK, time for a few of my personal thoughts on the matter. It's quite clear that there's currently a lot of anger in the world, and rightly so. People are struggling to pay their bills, and some are going hungry. And nothing is more of a motivating factor to take to the streets than an empty stomach. Some countries have it worse than others, but all of them have a breaking point. And let's not forget about that 3.5% critical mass. Now, developing countries are those which are perhaps closest to the edge. And while I've only talked about those with sizable protests, there are also a number of other countries that are struggling. Countries in the Middle East and Africa are also facing severe food shortages. And let's not forget that one of the contributing forces behind the Arab Spring in 2011 was a shortage of bread, a spark that set off a chain reaction. And although you may live in a country that hasn't seen these types of protests yet, you will at least have felt some of the same pressures. Food and fuel inflation is no joke, and the policies that have been implemented by Western governments often exacerbate it. Moreover, it doesn't look like the conflict in Ukraine is coming to an end anytime soon. The war and resulting sanctions are leading to a hell of a lot of collateral economic damage. So, what's the solution? Well, I'm no geopolitical expert, but energy and food independence have shown themselves to be of vital importance. Governments should implement policies that encourage local production of these resources. They should also aim to limit inflation by reducing the excessive spending that is supercharging demand-side inflation. In the end, though, there are no quick fixes here. It'll take years for countries to become food and energy independent, and that's if they even can. Some countries cannot produce their own energy, or they lack the arable land to grow enough of their own food. And when it comes to inflation, while central bankers have aggressively reversed course, it may be a bit too late. They've come to the realisation that inflation cannot be reined in without seriously impacting economic growth. My only hope is that governments implement common sense policies before civil unrest reaches revolutionary levels. So long as they show that they are trying to address these concerns, it may at least help to reduce a temperature that is getting seriously close to boiling point. And that's it for my video today, folks, but I would love to get some of your feedback, though. So, do you think that these protests are likely to increase? Is there anyone out there from Argentina, Peru, Panama, Pakistan, Indonesia, or Holland who wants to share their story? Let me know down below. And while you're down there, you can also find links to all the other places you can follow me apart from YouTube. These include my Telegram, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. And, of course, the creme de la creme, my weekly newsletter. Here I share upcoming videos, market updates, and a breakdown of my personal portfolio. Also, if you're looking for some of the best discounts and promos in the space, then touch base with my deals page. Discounts that only viewers of this channel get to take. All of that which you shall seek is there at the tippity top of that description box. And finally, if you found this video fire, then fire up the likes. Don't forget to subscribe to make sure you're in line to receive my latest crypto vibes. Oh, and hit that bell as well. We don't want it to get lonely. That's it for today, my fellow crypto fans. This guy's got to fly, so see you on the flip side. Oh.
Thank you.